All right, welcome back to the lecture for lesson five. Uh, this is part two for this week. Um, and this is gonna be about the Atlantic slave trade. So this is a perfect continuation of that last lecture I was just doing. Um, real quick, slavery in world history. Um, slavery has been around pretty much as long as human civilization has. Most ancient civilizations have some form of slavery. There is slavery in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, Egypt, you name it. Um, estimates are that somewhere around 30% of both the population of Athens and Rome were slaves. Uh, there's the Doomsday Book of 1086 that was written in England. And it says that about 10% of English population was slave. So slavery has been around for a long, long time. And that's really important to know. Slavery has even existed in Africa. Um, for example, in Africa, uh, there was no such thing as land ownership. So it was really the control of human labor that made wealth. Uh, so slaves in Africa, they were kind of seen as a stock an investment, if you will. Uh, in Africa, the enslaved person is treated relatively well, but they had no personal rights, they had no civil rights, but they did have some legal protections. Uh, the owners could order the slave to do any sort of work, but slavery was not hereditary. So if a slave had children, those children were free, and very often slaves could own other slaves, and slaves were given freedom. Something that's not very well documented and not talked about very much is an Islamic slave trade. Uh, that happened in the 700s and continues on in some cases to today. Um, slaves would be taken to the Mediterranean coast, loaded on ships, and then taken to the east to places like India, China, Russia, the Middle East. We don't actually know how many people are transported in the Islamic slave trade. I've seen estimates 10 to 15 million people, and I went on the low end here for 10 million. Now, what you probably know better when you think of slavery is plantation-style slavery, also known as chattel slavery. And this is going to be a development out of the... Colombian exchange. There's this desire for sugar and sugar is very labor intensive. You have to have a lot of money. You have to have a lot of land and you have to have a lot of labor for sugar plantations. When the first sugar plantations are set up by the Spanish, they try to use local populations, but these local populations either die of disease or they're worked to death or they run away. Now remember, um, they all the people kind of look the same they blend in together so if they ran off the plantation and went back to their local village or whatever it's going to be very very hard for them to come back after the failure of local labor you start to get white servitude. This is something you may have heard of before. Uh, most often you think of it as indentured servitude. Uh, that's where somebody is given a contract in return for passage to the new world. So maybe you're not doing so well in England or you're not doing so well in Spain. Uh, you find a wealthy benefactor who agrees to pay for your transport to the new world, but you have to work for them for five year period, seven year period, something like that. Um, there's a lot of convict labor, especially from England, Scotland, and Ireland. That was encouraged because it was a way to get rid of what they considered an undesirable population, plus it provided a labor force for plantation owners in the new world. Then you have these groups called redemptioners. Uh, maybe they have arranged to pay for their passage to the new world, but when they have to pay the debt, they don't have the money, so then they have to work off whatever debt they have accrued. 
Now, even though there are three different types of white servitude, uh, there are some general things that are true about it. Uh, number one, it's voluntary. More, most of the time it's voluntary. Even convicts, convicts could volunteer to go or not go. Um, they're often in search of a better, better life. Um, they're in search of a better life. Uh, they're trying to get rid of religious persecution. They're trying to get out of prison, whatever it might be, but they're trying to find success. Uh, it's a very s corrupt system, though. Uh, some people are kidnapped. Uh, some people are forced into unfair contracts or the goalposts of those contracts keep changing. Uh, for example, in a lot of indentured servitude contracts, even though it was a five-year contract, if you got hurt, the timer stopped. If you had a child, the timer stopped, whatever it may be. Eventually, white servitude is going to be replaced by African slavery, and that's really over one issue, the idea of control. With indentured servitude, once the contract is over, the labor is gone. The servants could go and buy land, start their own farms, and they became competition. But with African slavery, the slaves were under the complete control of their owners for life and not just a short amount of time. Another question people have is why Africa? Well, it's because geographic proximity. When you really look at it, Africa and South America is not far apart. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense to use somebody from Asia or India because the travel was much, much further. So Africa becomes the chosen point for slavery. There's also the fact that Europe and Africa had been linked since ancient Greek, ancient Roman times. So there were established trading relationships. <clears throat> Textile, steel, iron, food, cloth, gold, whatever was already being traded. So this is just one more thing in the trading system. Slavery already exists in Africa. So it's not recreating the, the wheel, if you will. The African slaves are just going to a different person or a different group of people. And then there's the existing slave trade going east. They're basically just going to redirect the boats to go west. Now, European powers, specifically the Portuguese, uh, eventually the English, they're going to set up these fortified trading ports where African slaves are going to be brought to the coast by middlemen. Uh, they're basically told, go into the, the continent and provide a certain number of slaves. In exchange for this, um, the African middlemen are going to be given guns and other European luxuries like um, you know, finished tools, finished product, whatever it may be. And if these African middlemen who become accustomed to these European luxuries want to keep getting them, they have to keep providing more slaves. You've probably also heard of the Middle Passage, but what is it? Well, the Middle Passage, there's 20 principal slave markets. They go from Senegal to Angola. This is known as the Gold Coast or the uh, Coast of Guinea. And it's about a 3,000 mile coastline. A couple of smaller markets in there too. Most of the slaves who are sold are not from the coast. They're from the interior. Usually they're prisoners of war. Usually they're criminals. And the ways that these people became slaves, different. Sometimes it was warfare, prisoners of war. Sometimes they were criminals. Uh, sometimes it's kidnapping. It just kind of depended on the different reason. Uh, what's even more sad is this was also a time of famine. And some families would actually sell their children in exchange for food. Uh, your family's gotten too big. You just, you can't take care of everybody. Where were the slaves going? This is a 
slide that always surprises people. About 32% of all the slaves taken from West Africa go to Brazil. Another 24% go to the British Caribbean. About 17% go to the French Caribbean. 13% go to Spanish colonies. Only 4%, still a great number, but only 4% actually make it to North America. And when people hear that number is only 4%, they're usually really surprised. What happens when the slaves are actually brought to the coast? Well, uh, the slaves are going to be sold together. They're going to be roped together. They're going to be handcuffed together, usually in groups of four, sometimes groups of six. They're going to be told to carry all their emergency provisions. And if there are any children to be sold, the children are carried by these slaves while they're handcuffs. Uh, this is known as a coffle. When these slaves reach the coast, they're going to be put into sheds or cages, and they're going to sit there in these sheds or in these uh, cages until they can be looked at. They're going to be inspected by doctors to make sure that they are good. Some of them would be set aside to be branded if they're being sold to a specific person or to a specific trade company. Others are going to be tagged somehow. But no matter what happens, they're eventually going to be loaded onto boats. Now, children were not desired. As a rule, most African traders, uh, they wanted to keep female children in Africa almost to be like domestic servants or breeding stock. I hate to put it that way, but these are people who are treated more like animals than they are people. So it's almost like a puppy mill, only this is going to be a slave mill. Children were often seen as a high risk because they have high death rates on the voyage across they provide low profits once they get to the trading block, and they're not able to do labor or produce offspring for many years. So children were not preferred in any way. Now, after the, the slaves are taken to the ships, and to get to the ships, by the way, they're beaten, they're pushed, they're dragged, they are forced to the big ships on canoes, they are then boarded onto ships. They're shackled together two by two. The right wrist and ankle of the one on the right is going to be shackled to the ankle of the person next to them. And they're sent into the hold of the slave ship. Now, the slave ship, it, the hold of it, the cargo area is usually only about five feet high. Um, they are going to be completely packed in like sardines, laying down. There's no standing up. And if there's enough space left over, a second layer of slaves will be put down. By the time it's done, you usually have about 20 inches or so for your headroom. It's less than two feet above you. So if you're claustrophobic, this is going to be really, really bad. Uh, disease is prevalent on the ships. There's disease like smallpox, measles, malaria, um, if somebody got sick, there's nothing that can be done. Everybody has to stay in the hold. Everybody has to stay on the ship. Sickness spreads. Um, the last two or three days of the, the voyage to the New World, the slaves are going to be released from their irons. They're going to be given larger meals. They're going to be given water so that they can kind of perk up and look healthy when they're sold. There's also this idea of loose packers versus tight packers. Uh, if a captain was a tight packer, they're going to put as many people on the ship as they can, regardless on who's going to live, who's going to die. Basically, they're going to say they get the most profit by providing the most volume of trade. But then there's loose packers who say, we won't put as many people on the ship because quality over quantity. 
Now, either way you look at it, if you're a quality over quantity person or a quantity over quality person, you have to remember we're talking about human beings being sold and traded, like the cows that are outside my office here on the Carrollton campus. Uh, this is a, a picture or a depiction of what a coffle caravan would look like. You can see people are chained together children are chained together and everybody is being forced to bring their own provisions with them. This is a example of what a slave ship could look like, both from the side view and the top view. Just to give you an idea that everybody's laying down, hundreds of people are put on a ship and there's absolutely no room to move. Auctions, once the people reach the intended location, uh, it's time to sell the cargo. Uh, many times there's going to be a dealer who takes charge of the sale uh, that is going to be in exchange for a 15% or so profit. Uh, every once in a while, the whole cargo is going to be sold to one planter. That kind of changes things a little bit. Um, and occasionally, a captain will sell their own slaves, but that's very rare. It was seen as too much trouble. The first thing that's going to happen is the captain's going to look at the cargo, going to pick out those who have been sick, those who are diseased, those who have been injured, basically those who can't be sold easily. And they're going to be sold basically in the dark for a cheaper price. Those who are diseased are either going to be thrown overboard or left on the dock. And anybody who's not sold is going to be left to starve. Healthy slaves are going to be taken to a public auction block. Uh, potential buyers are going to examine the teeth, examine the body. Uh, very often the the back is going to be looked at for lash marks. Uh, women are going to be checked for, um, how do I put this gently, um, to see if they can produce offspring. Uh, some slaves were even required to run and jump. Uh, children were asked to run and jump to prove that they could be useful. And many buyers are going to prefer a mix of ethnic groups. And the reason for that is there were fears of slave rebellion, slave revolts. If too many people were from one ethnic group or if too many people spoke a similar language, these slave owners were afraid that rebellion could happen. Another big part of this is the triangular trade. Uh, it's this trading group, this trading route that's going to link Africa, the Americas, and Europe together. Uh, slaves are taken from Africa and brought over to the New World and in small numbers to Europe. Very often these slaves are going to be used on sugar plantations. Sugar is then going to be taken to North America and Europe where it's turned into rum. The sugar sellers buy rum and then take that rum back to Africa where then it's used to buy more slaves. Uh, eventually when the tobacco industry and the cotton industry gets going, this system is used for both tobacco and cotton also. And here's kind of just a visualization of what it looks like. So you have traders going from the Gold Coast to the New World. They trade slaves for sugar. Sugar goes to the English colonies where it's turned into rum. And then rum goes back to Africa for more slaves. Big question modern historians have. And this is still being debated today. How many people were brought to the New World? Depending on the historian, you get different numbers. 
Uh, there's a story named Philip Curtin puts a number right around 10 million. Paul Lovejoy, who I've studied many books of, puts it closer to 12 million. Uh, the high number, uh, Joseph Inakori, is almost 14 million. And I've seen a number as high as 15 million. Either way, whether it's 10 million or 15 million, that's a lot of people sold into slavery. And that's also not counting the other 10 to 15 million people who went to the Islamic slave trade. So we're talking numbers as much as 30 million, if not more, who were sold into slavery. Now, what does this do for Africa? Well, it causes a gender imbalance. It causes a complete failure of ethnic groups. It causes famine. It causes warfare. It causes problems that are still being seen today in 2021. All right, so let me pull up the syllabus and let you let you see this. So we are on this week right here, and the work for this week. There's two. There are two discussions: discussion three and discussion four. And there's chapter eighteen and chapter nineteen quizzes. If you have an old copy of the syllabus downloaded or printed out or something. I have moved the first reflection paper from this week to next week. So reflection paper one will not be due until the 15th now. The syllabus is updated. This calendar is updated. The due dates are updated as well. So if you're looking at it, you're saying, wait, something changed. You're right, it did. I, I wanted to make this week a little easier for you since you had not one but two different lessons to go over. There are five primary source readings. Um, I think they are all very, very interesting for this week. But of course, I'm going to say that for every week. So I apologize. Uh, one last thing for you before I get done talking. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I told you that there would occasionally be opportunities for extra credit. And I'm going to give you one right now. If you've made it through both videos, and if you hear this message, it is 3.50 on Tuesday the 2nd. If you message me in Blackboard with the following word I'm going to give you, by Friday at 9 p.m., I will add five points to your Chapter 17 quiz. Now, what is that word, you may ask? That word is bluey, B-L-U-E-Y. So if you can message me in Blackboard the word bluey, B-L-U-E-Y, by Friday at 9 p.m., you get five extra points on your Chapter 17 quiz. Now, you may be asking, where did that word come from? Well, bluey, B-L-U-E-Y, happens to be my three-year-old child's favorite TV show right now. Okay, I think that's plenty for this week. Two videos, each one like 20 minutes long. You're probably tired of hearing me talk. So I'll end it here. If you have any questions, concerns, anything like that, just send an email and I'll answer you. We'll see you soon. Bye.